Honda, can you hear me clearly? I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Um, good to see so many people here. So I'm covering over the undocumented little known Infamix features. Um, there's quite a few features in the product that perhaps are not that widely used. So um, I'll start with those. And I've got demos for quite a lot of this stuff, although not everything. So the I'll start off with the kind of the general features that I found that are documented, but perhaps not that well known. Um, you can have what are called sharded queries. So you can actually have your data stored across multiple Infamix servers and set up such that you can query tables that are stored on multiple Infamix servers. So you can actually scale out rather than up to your estate. Improve performance that way. And um, it's quite well um, documented. I won't put a demo together for this because it's quite an, quite an involved thing to do. But um, I'll give you a feel for how this hangs together. Um, this involves enterprise replication. So for each Infamix server, you have to set the shard ID on it to actually say that it's part of this cluster. And then when you run your queries, you set an environment saying use sharding on. And that means that you can then query the same table that is stored across multiple Infamix servers. The way this is done behind the scenes is you actually end up using enterprise replication behind that to actually set up your cluster and be able to store your data across multiple Infamix servers with the replication handling the placement of the data. So you actually set up um, an SQL host entry that has a group of servers in it and you define a group with a unique group number as well, an ID for the group as well. And then once you've got that set up and you've got on it and you build your enterprise replication, you can then go in and define your sharding for your, for your cluster. So you create the same table on every node in your enterprise replication setup group and then go in and you can then say shard my table a sharded table across all these different Infamix servers. So you define what's called a shard collection. And as with um, normal table-based fragmentation partitioning, you can do this multiple different ways. So you can either hash on one particular on a set of columns and say, I always want this um, set of data to be spread across in a consistent way across this, so it's hashed in a consistent way based upon the values of the specific column or field that you want to distribute. Or you can do what's a, non a general normal hash of a, of a column as well. So again, you can distribute via hash based. Or you can do similar to, um, similar to table partitioning and fragmentation, you can, you can, put, you can do expression based sharding across Infamix servers. So you can say this particular server group I have these particular values and then put another values in another group and another one in another group and then you have a remainder clause as well just as you have with uh, table partitioning. And you can't have overlapping values. So for example if if here you have this set up here, the value of 50 could be in either two of these places, so it won't work. That. So you've got to make sure that every value goes in one particular place. And that allows you to scale up. Not sure if that may, that may people do it, but it is available and they keep enhancing it all the time in every release. Uh, I thought I could just highlight that as, um, I mean, not perhaps not that well known or considered, but it's not that complex to set up. You do need to know a little, have to do a little bit of enterprise replication setup, but it's literally create your table on every server and it's just do a definition to, to make that into a table that's sharded across all of that that you can query as if it was a normal table. There are some limitations on that. You can't use data blade. UI's routines, so you can't use defined types. You can't use, use Java, use defined routines. So, all procedures written in Java. You can't have triggers, which is a bit of a limitation, but you can't have triggers. And you can't do select for update as well. 
but the main one I noted was that you can't run execute you can't use store procedures or functions to operate on a sharded table. I'm hoping that they, some of these limitations might go away. They keep um, they keep enhancing this. This is from version 14. This is the current set of limitations. But with every release, they've been enhancing this. So you may find some of these go away in the future. I don't know what happens. The one thing as well, you can't, if you've got a the key that you're sharding on, you can't move, you can't, can't move between servers. So if you want to update the sharding key and move that to another server, you'd have to do a delete and then an insert to update that, that key value. But you can't use uh, XA distributed transactions in those. It's the sharded query is something perhaps to look at as we consider if you need to scale up. I mean, so you need to scale out rather than just up. Scaling it, running, running queries across, throwing it across multiple servers and be able to query it as if it was on one server. Um, as data volumes grow, one of the things you might want to also consider is parallel backups. And this is actually quite simple to set up now with Infamix having its own primary storage manager, PSM included in there. And I have a demo for that as well. I'll show you how easy it is actually to set up parallel backups and um, how you can actually see what's been stored and, and the volume the volume of data that's been stored when you when you're doing your parallel backups. I'll put a demo here. So I've got an Infamix server here, and first thing I need to do is. Decide configuration I'm going to use for my parallel backups. In other words, how, how many parallel streams I want, how parallel I want my backup to be. So there's a little bit of configuration here from the defaults. You decide when you're doing parallel backups how many DB spaces you want to back up in parallel. I've set them to four, and I normally set restore the same, so you restore in parallel the same way as well. You as you're using the Infamix built-in storage manager, you can use the default value for bar BSA, BSA lib path, which in version 14, this is a newly installed server, it, it defaults to the, um, the library that you need to run Infamix parallel storage manager. So those are the on-bar level um, parameters that you set up. And then for the storage manager itself, there's a little bit of setup in the on-config as well where you set up where you want the catalog to be. So um, for your backups, you have what are called pools. So you put your data back up at level zero, level one, level two as, as a, in one pool, and then log backups go in a separate pool. And then you have to decide where you want to put your catalog so it can it has its own, has its own catalog for tracking all the backups and all the different different parts of the backup, which I'll show different DB spaces and it even backs up the um, SQL host file and the on config file. Um, calls them critical files, but you've got to store, decide where the catalog that tracks all this is going to be stored. So I've put that in slash backup slash catalog. And I haven't got that folder yet, but as root, I'm going to go in and make a folder there. Then I make sure that's owned by Infamix. So Infamix can write to it. Builds my sets up my folder where I'm going to store everything. Backups folder owned by Infamix where I'm going to store everything. Then as Infamix, I can go in and start to do the setup for storage manager. One thing I did notice is if you just ask for help for the storage manager, you, ha you haven't got any set up, you haven't got a catalog set up. There's nothing there in your backups folder. You just run the, the command to get the help for the storage manager. It actually goes off and says, I didn't find a catalog in the folder that you said, backups catalog. It goes off and creates the catalog for you. And then says I've succeeded in creating a catalog. So 
one thing to be aware of is even if you just run the help to um, figure out how to use this, it will go off and create the catalog for you. By default, that'll be on, in your Infamix DIR under a folder called Backup. So it'll actually create a backups folder and then put the catalog in there. Something to be aware of. So we build a catalog. In there, we have a bunch of files which actually look very much like CISM files because, as I've discovered, they are CISM files. You have a dat and a .idx. Um, it looks like they're reusing some of the CISAM technology to actually store, actually build the catalog. Very similar to a standard engine database for those who use standard engine, but it's not quite using the same. What well, these will be, these will be standard engine tables and standard engine technology. It's not quite the same, but it's kind of using that technology to um, build the catalog and store the catalog. That's what it certainly appears to be doing. So the storage manager starts off and you have pools for your storage manager. So you have a data and a log pool and you can even have an, have an external pool as well for ex I guess external backups. I've got my two pools set up, one for data, one for level zero, um, DB space backups, and one for oh, that's level one and level two, and one for my log backups. That's my initial pool set up. And I can go off and look for devices. And by default, you get two devices, which are folders where you where you'll, where you'll be storing backups. So for those people who write um, use on tape to do backups to folders, these are the folders that, that would be used for your backups. If you're using parallel backups under the inf default, the Infamix Storage Manager goes under Infamix DR backups. So I don't want them there. I want them in the Place I'm going to control. So the first thing I do is delete those devices, those, those um, the references to those folders. I take one out of the DBS pool, and then one out of the log pool, and I have nothing there. So I've just cleaned up those default devices. Set up. I'm going to set up my own devices folders I'm then going to as info I'm going to write to the backups folder I'm going to create a data folder for my, my level zero one two and three archive and a separate one so I'm going to Add those folders into the configuration. So for my level zero archives, I'm going to say this. I'm adding this folder in. It's a type file, so it's not a tape. It's a file folder, and the priority it has highest. So you can have different folders with different priorities. I only want one, so I'm going to create it as the highest priority. Then I get. Same for my log backups. So I'll put them, add that back in as well for my log backups. Then I'm going to do a check on my catalog to make sure everything's okay. Check. Those people who've used Standard Engine and um, CI SAM, you might recognize this kind of output like a v-check in standard engine that's going to see check of its catalogs and tells you to repair anything or it's okay so good on there the other thing i do as well is to have a look at the catalog you can actually see if backups are running you can actually see if there's any backups running you know, you'll have each one will create a session Store referencing the catalog and love it and love the, the process ID of the on bar process doing the backup as well. So you can see if there's any um, backups running at the current time and what those processes are. And it can, the catalog can also get into a lock state. There's problems with sessions, etc. So you can also unlock the catalog as well. This can help for that. Everything looks good. 
There's no sessions running at the moment and the catalog's unlocked. So I'm all good to stop to run a parallel backup. Hopefully, well, so back up. And that's my backup. Let's just check that worked. Oops. Data that's been stored. So we can, you can list objects that have now been backed up. And we find on my server, my server name, my root DBS got backed up zero there's the file that got created got backups there it's also backed up the um so your on bar itself has a it stores its own list of list of the backup objects so it's backed that up itself it's backed up your on config file and your sql host file and there's an on cfg file as well used at runtime so it's backed that up as well and it calls these critical files. So that is as easy as it gets really set up. Catalog, you set up some pool, couple of pools, configure a couple of device folders for each thing, for each object, and then it'll and then you just run the unbar command, do the backup, and do a whole system backup and level zero. Literally a few minutes work to set this up and to get running and you can see when it got, when the object got created and you can see the size as well this works best if your db spaces are equal size because you can then um, get the most parallelism from the backup so if you've got one db space that's much larger than the others then all the others complete and you'll have one session running one process running backup process running that will that will then carry on and finish off that very large db space and obviously you're not getting as much parallelism as you could so the backups will take longer to run you're not getting the benefit of reduction in backup time but there is some work to consider up front you might have to do things to resize your db spaces do partition tables round robin potentially to get them evenly sized the db spaces evenly sized but it's not a huge amount of work to set up parallel backups not something to think that, that it's a very involved process. Obviously, you've, you've backed up everything into a, into a set of folders, the objects under there. So then you need to back back those folders up and take, maybe store them off the machine somewhere, put them off the tape or put them off to some, um, copy them off to an NFS server or something. There is another layer. This is just, this is on the database server itself. It will write them out. You write your database out to a set of files in parallel. You've then got to do the another backup. You don't, you try and make that to be a separate bit of storage to folders that you're using for backup, but to be doubly sure, you'd want to copy them off somewhere else as well. So you'd have to have a separate step in your backup process to do that as well. The actual parallel backup is not that difficult to configure. Some of the things that I found when I go looking through um, this master database, I found that for locks you can actually for locks you can actually see when the when the lock was granted. So um, that can be very useful in monitoring. I've not really seen that mentioned anywhere before, but I I go reading this master definition and find things for help with, with um, monitoring. So that was the one I found. So oh, oh, sorry, I'll cover one more bit. She's cleaning up your backup afterwards as well. You can say for your, your um, backups, you can say how many backups you want to keep and you can automatically clean them up uh, on SM Sync. Uh, so, Clean up my backup objects. Only keep the keep the current, even the current one. And if you try and do that, say it won't let you do it. It basically says, like you're doing that, you're trying to clean up everything. But really want to enforce cleanup. You can override that with um, 
minus O. So I know what I'm doing. I want to go and clean up. For example, if you're experimenting with this and you want to clean it up quite easily. Do a clean up like that on SM Sync. So I don't want to keep any any level zeros. I just want to clean everything up and I'm going to force that. And you go back and look at your backup objects. Everything's gone apart from the critical files. They don't get cleaned up by that. So try and do that. There's an option to clean that up with the minus CFES. And even though it um, can come back with any errors, you can actually find if you try and do it and not and try and clear everything up, you find that um, it still saves. Stay there. So there's a command to clean up objects. You can say this object, delete this particular object, and you pass minus O in the object ID. The object ID has been here. So I've got objects six to nine. The one thing I did find for that quite useful if you're cleaning up your experimenting and you want to clean up is there's a Linux SEQ command that says generate me the numbers starting with six and ending with nine. And you can loop around those and delete those objects. The one PSM minus O del O the number of the object and a minus Y. That objects them again they're all gone so you can go in and manually delete objects there's two options you can either use on sm sync and says they keep these many level zero backups going backwards or you can go in and if you really want to you can manually go in and delete objects by the object id some kind of problem something you can go in and delete space back So coming back to locking, you can see the time locks were granted. Lock there. I looked at um, this file here, Infamix DIR, etc. Sysmaster, which is the definition for Sysmaster. So if I go off and then look for what locks I've got. DB info to convert. I convert the time in the table which is an integer I convert it to a time I can see for this lock on this um part num this row ID I can actually see when it got granted as well. Not seen that mentioned anywhere but quite useful you can see something holding a lock for too long. That's on that to say something's locked for a very long time. If it's not a database level lock, say something's holding a lock problem somewhere I can do. If you have an ongoing transaction, you can start to do something to actually predict how long it will take for the object to or the transaction to roll back. And you can do that. So either you can either use um, on stat minus X or you can look in Sysmaster, there's this trans table. I've actually got an ongoing transaction running here. If I do on that minus X, there's my transaction running. So I've got um, begin and in time, in log position, and I've got the current log position. And I've got an estimate of how long it'll take to roll back. That's based on some on config settings that get dynamically updated every time you go through crash recovery called the speed ones so you get physical log speed and logical log speed they're only updated when you go through crash recovery so you can be in the situation where these haven't been filled in yet for example this is a new new built server i haven't restarted it so it has a zero in there, so we can't really estimate how long it'll take. But this estimate for the rollback time is actually based on those two values. So the time here 
may or may not be that accurate. It's based upon the last crash recovery that you went through. So depending upon how your storage is behaving or especially if it's shared storage, then that number may not may or may not be that accurate. That's probably the best estimate you can get for that really. What you find actually is you've got the beginning of your transaction. That's the log number and the position within the log. And you have currently where it where it is up to in the position in the log. When it starts to roll back, this current log position will start to go backwards. The number the numbers here start to go down and it gradually gets closer and closer to this begin log position. When it reaches that begin log position, there may be a little bit of a pause while it cleans up the any structures remaining with the transaction and actually then the transaction is fully rolled back and goes way out of this list. So can use if you're watching this with the best way to see or to estimate a rollback is to watch this or perhaps you can build a script to watch this and see how the numbers are changing over time and you can try and do your own prediction as well um, as to how long things will roll back and maybe a bit better than this because that's based on the crash recovery whereas this is looking at these and seeing how quickly or how long you think it'll take for this to do as it's, you can see as it's changing and see how long it'll estimate how long it'll take to get back to there so for this particular rollback you can actually if you're analyzing that you can start to see and say how long will it take do i think it'll take for this to roll back this particular rollback to complete found that quite useful as well there are um remote transactions you can have um distributed transactions so called XA transactions and if you have applications that are using that you can run on stat minus G example here but it'll tell you if you've got any global transactions or called global transactions running you can get some information about those as well and see for example if one's sitting around for a long time you might you might alert on that to say oh I've got a global transaction that doesn't seem to be going away so um, that could be um, a transaction that's running across Infomix and other um, other application servers for example etc or other database products where you're doing a transaction across multiple different environments and you want to keep an eye on this to make sure none of these are actually hanging around for too long which could indicate a problem either Potentially even with Infamix, but it could also be on the other environment as well. Where the other environment isn't isn't rolling, isn't either getting stuck or isn't rolling back. So you can see these transactions are hanging around, and you can um, do some investigation as to what's happening there. One one to be aware of. Um, perhaps check that on your systems to see if there's any of these happening, which you might not be aware of. It's not that obvious unless you run on stat minus G to see. Hey, we do have some of these. And um, I will mention a couple of things in terms of being able to do some more in-depth analysis on your server. So you have on step minus G SPI, where you can see spin locks that are happening within the server. Right here, I'm not sure any got ones buffers, but I haven't got any buffer ones on this one. But what you find is if you get any that have there we go. You get fast mutex BF. If you get far in order to get SPR, you get fast mutex BF. You'll get two numbers on the end of that. One will be the part num for your for the object for the buffer that's in memory currently and then after that you'll get the address of that as well the address of the, that buffer in memory and you can dump that memory on stat minus gdmp stat dmp the address of the buffer from on stat minus gspi and then 
compute the size of the buffer and then you can actually see the header on the buffer and actually be able to know internal page structures you can actually work out what's in your buffer pool time and be able to do some analysis on hot buffers that are happening within your environment um, be aware though that when you see the um, fast mutex bf that is for that particular buffer in memory that particular page in memory and different buffers could have been there at could have been in memory at different times using that so different pages from different tables could actually have hashed onto that particular buffer and they could actually what's in the buffer currently may not be what was in the buffer previously so the spin lock numbers include everything in that particular memory and page in memory and that could be down to different buffers on disk different pages from your database that happen to end up in that buffer but what you get from the onset minus G SPI is what's in there now but the counters you get from there these ones the number of weights and the number of loops will actually be and the average loop per weight will be for that page that buffer and memory memory and multiple database pages could have occupied that since your server's been up or since you reset these stats so it doesn't necessarily mean that the page in there now is the one that's the hot page it could just be that, that the hot page got forced out another page came into that this particular mutex buffer um, page in memory and therefore you have to do a bit of analysis on that and perhaps capture that on a regular basis to see what's in your buffer pool and what buffers are hot but that does allow you to spot things like particular pages in memory that are hot that actually indicate contention in your database and you can analyze those as well coming back to that um, you want to see what's in your buffer pool on stat minus p is quite useful so you can actually stat p what i have in here is um, the contents of my buffer pool but it's summarized summarized on um by part num so you can have different buffer buffer pools in memory based on the page size but you can look in that in this case the, the 2k page size these are the part noms i have that are in there currently and how much how many pages for that part number in there currently so this is the sort of data you could put into csv files capture it every 5, 10, 15 minutes, plot that information and see what's in my buffer pool. Um, is stuff getting pushed out of my buffer pool that it happens to be an object that I think I know I'm going to need? You can see if perhaps your buffer pool is too, too small or perhaps your queries are running inefficiently and they're, they're, having, they're reading a lot of pages that um, they don't necessarily need to read because perhaps you're not indexing it, so you're getting a large table scan. And then most of those pages that have been read into the buffer pool and are pushing this total number up are not actually being used by returned back to the query. So you can then optimize your query and say, okay, whatever's accessing this part num, if this number's getting very big, um, you can then look into it and say, what's accessing this part num? How we make the queries that are accessing that part num more efficient? And we make them read less pages from this part num and therefore free up some of the buffer pool here reduce their footprint in the in the buffer pool and improve the caching for other part nums that ha happen to be in your database if you see if you see this distribution is changing a lot over time quite regularly you might say mm, maybe my buffer pool is increasing or maybe i need to optimize some of my queries so i'm having to cache less of my database And then I've, there are quite a lot of things you can look at inside the Infamix server itself that are not documented. I found quite a few of these documented on the internet. I know they're publicly available, so I can mention them in this talk. As these things are, are if you Google them, you will find they're publicly documented. So begin to 
a bit more of the intels. You can find some interesting stuff out about what's going on in your server. So this is more digging in a bit to um, the sort of thing technical support would be doing, but it can allow you to look into a few things and actually see um, if you're being hit by certain defects as well. Um, these are publicly available defects, so I'll they're Googleable without an IBM account. So um, I can also mention these as well. So, uh, I'll start from the beginning, which is there's a there was a thing that came in. I think it might have been version nine or version ten called RAS, which is reliability, availability, and serviceability. If you run this on StatMine Institute RAS. Will tell you um, value, tell you a whole bunch of information, but it will actually give you a few memory addresses that are the starting point for looking into your server. You have an R head structure, which is probably the biggest one that I've come, I've come across. You can dump it using all these are on stat minus G DMP. So you have. Um, Read ahead one. That will give you a lot of information. Get things like number of sessions, total sessions, maximum sessions, next session ID to be allocated, lost. I think that's the time something lost connected. They're not documented, so it takes a bit of interpretation, but you can dig into this kind of stuff. And see quite a lot of information about what's happening inside your server, which you might want to use for analysis or for monitoring. Be aware they do change between versions. Um, it's not guaranteed to be there all, every time, anytime you make a change. And one of the ones that's publicly documented is this thing here. Or you look into that um, our head structure and you look for this thing, SH copy SH list. And if you look in version 14, it's not there anymore. So be aware this is the portion of the talk that um, can change without warning changing. Having said that, I did find an interesting page actually where IBM document how to use this DMP stuff information and this R head structure to actually work out the current value of CC flags in your server. Again, this is a public page. And um they actually say, look through, um, they, they try and look for the R head structure. This doesn't work on version 14. Um, I use the RAS bit to get the uh, where the R head is. This, but you dump that out, and in the R head structure, you look for SHCC flags, and you can see the C flag setting. So, this is some of that stuff that's kind of in a bit of a gray area. It's not, it's not technically documented, but then I find a, an article from IBM that actually uses that to actually help you get some information out of your server, running server. You can get that from onstat minus G CFG full that, but page up for that as well. If I try that on my server. Yeah. Value of CC flags and CC. So to look into structures, everything starts from the, if you look for sessions from one stat minus U, get the address of the um, session, dig into that, take that value there. And if you look into that, you get a structure that says my session information. Okay. That'll be this RSTCB in the master. Dig into that, find things like past error number. Things. This does come in useful for um, older versions where you may be able to find information out about temporary, get temporary table information out. But you start from the session, once that minus you go to the RSTCB, then go to the SCB structure.
rest of that and follow in from that out a bunch of information about the session. Control down into your session. And then drill down further. Get a whole lot of information, which is more of the SQL. I think this is more of the SQL layer. Eventually, drill in. Um, eventually, drill down through different layers of RS. B. You actually get a thing called an SPA. And that's the SPA cache, briefly mentioned in. Known defect where um, you can get excessive reads on on a particular store procedure if you don't have this info, if you don't have public execute permission on there or the user client DBA privilege. It mentions this SPA cache, and if that's zero, you don't have one against that session not zero you would have an SPA cache and therefore you may be you know if you're under a particular version it's been fixed in the latest version but if you did have that appearing you would then find out that you may be vulnerable to this particular defect it's a way of actually seeing if you've got um this could be affecting you potentially there are some um on the onset minus gs spi there's actually a session mutex. And something to see in here, there's a one called session, which indicates that um, you may have contention with sessions attaching, connecting or disconnecting to the database, especially on a large amount of sessions. So you can look into that, see how hot that mutex is. They've done a lot of very good work on this. They've fixed, they've made, the class is a defect, but actually they're actually making the product more scalable i've done a lot of really good work on this i'm quite impressed that they actually touched the part of the code used to do with connecting and disconnecting the sessions because obviously that's a very um, active and one of the most active part, parts of the code but they have gone in and touched that and they've made it even more scalable so if you're querying sys scb lst or sys sessions in sysmaster you can get weights on this session mutex that's now being resolved um, in sysmaster there on that sys sessions they actually had a forest of trees index which they first put in to improve scalability on sys rstcb but they've now done this as well they've rewritten the the session mutex to run even more efficiently there was a related apar for that uh, there was a slight problem with that but that's also been fixed as well and so if you've got these two different defects which i believe are fixed in 1410 fc6 then scalability in terms of being able to handle a large number of sessions to connecting and disconnecting has been improved even more. There are those tie backs. So if you see that session mutex is hot and you're not running on 1410 FC6, then look at getting to 1410 FC6. And a nice bit of scalability. And I think that's my session done. Rhonda? You did have some questions in the chat. I don't know if you wanted to expand on anything there. I can do. Um, can you read them out to me? Sorry, I'm a bit. Sure. I have to see them. Let's start at the top here. Um,
Somebody wants to know, can you set up retention for backups and how do you delete old backups? So, go back to the demo. Um, it's not really retention. You, you manage the retention yourself. So you'd have to know how often you're um, doing your backups. And then you'd say, they call them generations. So keep this many level zero backups. And um, otherwise, you could go in and Do you know go in, list the objects that you have. And that's what happens. So that's again. You, um, when you list the objects, you can actually see when they were when they were created. Stuff here. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question, but did you know that A B C runs simultaneously? Not sure I understand that one. Yeah, I don't either. Yeah. Yeah, so when you get your so when you get a list of backup objects, which I'm finding now, but it'll have actually when they were created. Well, I guess that's it then, David. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much for, for helping us out. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on. They're doing a lot of good work on the in even fix even including fix packs as well. I've got the version 14 talk coming up tomorrow. Yeah, they're doing a lot of good work on the product. They're making it more scalable. Um, but yeah. It's, uh, uh, for the person who wanted to know about the slides, the the actual sessions are being recorded, and when we get the uh, recording uploaded from WebEx, they'll be available for you. So just keep an eye on the link that you were sent to join the conference, and eventually when it's available, that link will be uh, active. Okay? Thanks again, David. I appreciate it. I'm going to start stop the recording now. Okay, thank you for having me.